Thank you very much indeed for that gracious uh, introduction. Um, I basically want to uh, today spend a little time talking about the kitchen yard. Uh, this is a, an old concept in a sense because this was how many households, particularly those in the rural and, and semi-rural areas around the country, uh, maintained themselves. They, they produced the majority of their own food. Um, we have changed as we've become urbanites. We've actually become less dependent on the kitchen garden and more dependent on the supermarket. So what I'm going to do is talk a little bit about the backgrounds to the development of kitchen uh, garden skills and garden skills in general. Um, in the 1900s, um, a lot of those skills were learned um, in the school, but also from the families of the, the settlers, particularly those in the farming communities who learned their skills. And, and many of us began uh, to learn about gardening really uh, in our school system. Now that is less evident today, although there are various uh, jurisdictions around the country, both here and in other countries as well, where this sort of tradition of learning how to grow plants, where they come, you know, where they, where your food comes from, uh, and so that is a, a tradition that is ongoing. Anybody who's in the uh, the teaching uh, discipline, there's a resource up there that I put up on that slide where you can get some documentation on how to go about setting up a, a school-based garden. Now, you know, most of the schools put all their ground down to sports facilities, but I, I think there's a role to uh, maintain gardens just so that people have garden skills as they go on and mature. I think we should, though, talk a little bit about how we go about setting up our own gardens. The focus in my talk here is going to be about vegetables, fruit, and some of the herbs that one would use in the kitchen. And that's why if it's a kitchen garden, this is how we uh, are going to use the food and uh, enhance it using herbs and various other um, plants that we gather. The main constraints that we have in choosing to set up a garden is the amount of land that we have available for this. Now, you know, in some settings, People have fairly large garden areas, in others, it's very constrained, even to the extent of being a balcony on somebody's condominium. Um, but even there, you have the opportunity to do some planting of vegetables and have what is a mini kitchen garden. Having said, the land is important. The orientation of that land is also important in terms of making sure that you are getting adequate sunlight to allow the plants to develop appropriately. Talking about the development of the plant, the climate that we are faced with here in Canada particularly um, limits the available growing season. So we have to plan accordingly to the kind of weather that we are likely to be um, impacted by. So here in Ottawa, typically uh, we consider the growing season, the, the safe time to plant things out is after the last frost, which is usually around Victoria Day. 
and that then depending on how soon snow flies, we may find the season ending in the October time frame, somewhere in the month of October. But that gives us a reasonable growing season. The other influence that uh, is out there is the type of soil that we have in our garden. Some soils are more productive than others. Some of the soils are better at retaining moisture than others. And so the kind of soil that we have will also influence how effective uh, we are at growing different kinds of vegetables. And we'll talk a bit about that when we get to the specific vegetables that we're going to look at. So garden options. If you're going to have a garden, what are your options? Well, traditionally, it's been what I call the flatbed or in the ground garden. In other words, you've got a piece of land and you're going to put your plants down on the soil just as it is lay it out in rows and plant it. The next option is the raised bed garden. There are various advantages in using a raised bed garden. One of the main ones is that you can have better control of the soil and the type of soil that you're growing in. You also can have a denser, uh, planting density, so that when you do plant out plants, um, you can get more plants in a smaller area. And it makes it easier for weeding and the general maintenance of that garden area. There are also container gardens, and we'll talk a bit more about these options as we go on, but those are the kinds of containers that you'd have on a patio, on your balcony, or just around your property. And then finally, there are these wall or shelf gardens. This is where you've got a very limited space, but now instead of taking up ground area, you actually put your garden vertically. And on this slide, you can see an example of it on the right-hand side of the slide. So, the flat bed or in-ground garden, these are usually laid out uh, with rows, blocks of plants. Interestingly enough, in this photograph, it shows one uh, important aspect to your planting strategy. You will notice that in amongst these plants, there are a number of flowers. In this case, uh, it looks as though, um, I'm not sure what we've got in there, but there are various flowers and, and we'll talk about the different flowers and the way you can use those flowers to actually act as companions to the vegetables because they tend to put off the other um, insects that can harm the vegetables. So we'll talk a little bit later on about companion planting. The raised bed gardens, as I said, as you can see in this picture, you can achieve a much higher density of uh, different plants within the same area. And this is where you don't tend to plant a large number of of one variety, but where you use different varieties to uh, provide support to the other plants within that uh, raised bed. Um, these, the, these are useful to do. Um, and in fact, you will find in some cases, you can even raise these beds to the extent you can put them um, a lot higher so that people can actually, uh, who, who are mobility impaired, can actually 
uh, move in around the plants and actually do the planting them themselves. Uh, it makes it a lot easier. You're not stretching over large areas. And by raising it up uh, a significant amount, they can actually uh, do the planting without having to bend over or get lower down on the ground. That can go to the extreme. Oops, sorry. Boom. Sorry about that. You've got to be careful with your mouse when it's a sensitive mouse. Um, here you've got the, uh, the different kinds of containers. And the one on the right-hand side, the, the tall one, uh, this is where you can bring the whole container up to waist height. Um, this kind of container also has the advantage that uh, they can have a water reservoir in the base of the container so that it, it maintains the moisture in the soil um, without you having to necessarily water it constantly. Um, the other ones are going back to traditional pots. Now, there are differences if you use the old-fashioned clay pots, uh, apart from the fact that they do tend to crack fairly easily, particularly if you leave them around too late with soil and in them into the winter, because as the frost hits it, uh, the water inside the pot in the soil expands and you end up with cracked, broken pots. Um, also, the old clay pots, um, they tend to dry out more quickly because the moisture within the soil permeates through the clay pots and those pots dry out. The more modern um, plastic pots um, do retain the moisture much more evenly, and they're not quite as susceptible to uh, frost uh, at the end of the year if you don't remember to clean them out of soil before the end of the season. The metal containers are, are certainly very attractive, they do tend to be somewhat more expensive. So, you know, you, you match your approach to what you've got available uh, around you. The wall or shelf gardens tend to be much more specialized. Um, the wall gardens, um, which are the, the long so shelves, um, they're, they're pretty good for, um, leaf vegetables and herbs, and even for flowers as well. But they are very expensive to, to purchase initially. But if you've got a very limited um, surface area and you want to do your gardening, they're one way you can go. The other one is the one on the right-hand side, which basically is a set of suspended boxes. Uh, that also provides you with a fairly dense um, area for planting uh, without taking up a lot of, of surface area. So, you know, as with everything else, you take an approach which fits the situation you're in. And if you want to do your gardening, well, that's how you do it. So let's talk a little bit about what a kitchen garden is and what we would expect to try and cover in the notion of a, of a kitchen garden. Now, where I come from originally, which is back in Britain, uh, if you had a lot of money, then you would tend to have a walled kitchen garden. In other words, it's a, it's a walled area of land with walls about eight foot high uh, that surrounds, even higher than eight foot sometimes, that surrounds the garden. It provides a microclimate in which you can grow your vegetables. But most of us nowadays uh, deal with the gardens that we, we have, which is often just a land with hedges or fences alongside it. And so we try and grow a variety of different uh, vegetables and fruit. So let's talk about fruit and fruit-bearing vegetables. 
So fruit you'd want in a garden would be apples, pears, plum, cherries, and then moving from the trees down to raspberries, which are a sort of a, a spur bush, strawberries, blueberries, and a variety of those. Also, uh, another very popular fruiting approach are tomatoes, corn, peppers, cucumbers, eggplants, squash, beans, peas, a whole range of other fruit bodies. Then, of course, there are the leaf, stem, and flower vegetables. So the leaf and stem vegetables are the cabbages, lettuce, spinach, kale, uh, celery, rhubarb. And then there are what I call the flowering vegetables, which are the broccoli, the cauliflower, asparagus sort of fits in there as well. And then finally, there are our root crops, potatoes, carrots, parsnips, turnips, onions, garlic, etc. So those are the, the range of uh, plants that we would typically find in a garden in this area of Canada. So what to plant, where to plant it, and when? Well, first of all, let's talk a little bit about tomatoes. They, they tend to be the most popular fruit uh, for people to grow at home. And tomatoes come in what I would call two different kinds. There are what are called determinants. And these determinant varieties are usually ones that have been genetically modified or bred so that they ripen, all the fruit on the plant ripens at the same time. And generally, the, the fruit are in a regular shape. And a lot of this has been um, driven by people wanting to go to the supermarket and get a bunch of ripe fruit on the vine looking the same. And so that's been one of the driving sources for determinant uh, varieties of tomatoes. The other kind of, of tomatoes are what are called the indeterminate varieties. A lot of these indeterminate varieties are old varieties that we've had around for a long time. Many of those are termed heritage varieties because they've been around for a long time. The fruit um, ripens at different times on the vine throughout the season. So it's not you get a whole vine of fruit at exactly the same time. On the indeterminates, they tend to mature at different rates on, on the plant. And also, the, plant, the, the fruit themselves tend not to be as uniform. They'll be misshapen, twisted, ridges, different colors. Um, so they vary uh, a lot. So when do you start them? Well, the usual rule is somewhere between February and April, and you start them indoors as seeds. Around here, I would probably start them late March, early April, um, so that they are not too leggy. And by leggy, I mean they haven't grown too tall uh, and, and very spidery. What you want is a, a plant that's fairly short, robust, and you want to take them out of doors and introduce them out of doors in the daytime, put them into a sheltered area in the evening, and then put them back out of doors again in the daytime for a couple of days while they harden up before you plant them out into the soil in their permanent setting for the year. Beans, on the other hand, um, they come in, in two basic kinds there. There's the bush beans, and these are beans that probably grow in a bush about 12 to 16 inches high, maybe sometimes 18 inches high. 
And as the name suggests, they're a low plant and they also tend to bear fruit at a similar time. They, they, they do spread out over time a little more. They're not like a determinate tomato. They, they do spread out, but they, they tend to come in a, 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 a flood of them at one point in time. The other kind of beans are climbing or pole beans. And to be honest, these are one of my favorites. You grow these on a frame of poles and they bear fruit at all heights throughout the season. In other words, these climb up the poles and they start flowering at different points uh, as they climb up. And some of the fruit will um, occur at the bottom and then at the top, and then you'll get more fruit later in the, the season, lower down. With these, again, you do not plant them indoors. You plant the actual seeds outdoors in early to mid-May. Again, usually it's when the soil has warmed up a little bit. If you put these seeds into the soil while it's still cold, it hasn't had enough time for the soil to warm up, they will rot and not germinate. So you really don't want to put them in too early. Um, I, I would sort of say, plant them out around here, probably about Victoria Day as well. That's a busy weekend for those who do their gardening. Squash, again, there are various kinds of squash. Oops, it is easy. Um, Summer squash, you're going to have zucchinis, uh, patty pans, yellow, and these are the ones that are going to um, produce fruit throughout the summer. Pumpkins, acorn squash, butternut, spaghetti squash, Hubbard squash, these tend to be your fall squash. So again, you plant these out and I hate to say it again, probably the best time is straight into the garden in uh, early to mid-May. Oops, next one. Sweet corn, and then, well, there are a lot of varieties that you'll find on the uh, roadside stand, but peaches and cream, honey and cream, those are the sort of things that you would grow at home. But again, remember, if you plant corn, corn is one of those um, vegetables that needs to be planted in a block. In other words, you need a square area of these so that they can cross-pollinate easily. Um, putting a row and just one row of corn in does not work. Uh, you need to pull them together into a block um, and doing it that way. Cucumber, both pickling and English kind. Those you can start indoors um, early May and then plant out uh, later in May, early June. Peppers, again, bell peppers, banana, whole range of those. Um, Again, you can start indoors in March and transplant out in May. Same goes for eggplants or aubergines, whichever you call it. Broccoli, cauliflower, cabbage, lettuce, and kale. Again, these can be started indoors. I'd probably start those in April uh, or actually plant them out of doors uh, in April as well late April though for, for outdoor planting. Indoors, you can do it uh, earlier in April. Potatoes, you tend to plant those, I would, I would say April, but given the weather for the last couple of years, I would almost wait until May. Potatoes, I have started planting them in potato boxes. So a potato box is basically a three foot by three foot box. And 
what you do is you plant the, some potatoes at the bottom, you put earth in, you wait for the, them to start sprouting and coming up, you put more earth in, you let them sprout, you put more earth in until you basically fill the box up with soil and it gives an opportunity to grow a large number of potatoes in a relatively small area. Carrots, parsnip, turnips, and beetroot. These you really want to just sow out of doors in early May. Um, they will um, either do them in rows or depending on the kind of garden there that you've got. Now, the exception to all of this tends to be garlic. And garlic is one of those plants you usually put and plant it in October, out of doors, and you cover it with mulch and you let it go through the winter. And then in the spring, it will take off and you will have um, your garlics by about the end of July, early August, they'll be getting close to being uh, ready for harvesting. Now, I said we talk a little bit about companion planting. Um, there is the old tradition of this, what's called the three sisters, that's corn, squash, and beans. And traditionally, these were three plants that you planted together in a cluster or a, a fairly close area because they um, supported each other. Um, the, the squash uh, tended to provide ground cover to smother weeds. Uh, the beans would grow above that uh, and provide you with a crop and the corn would grow even taller and provide you with another crop. It's a way of, of getting the various um, aspects of the plant to work together to produce the most plants. Now, there are other plants, and I right at the beginning, I talked about having flowers in the garden. And one of those that's really effective is marigolds. They tend to be very useful at keeping uh, a number of pests away from the plants. And you tend to plant them in between the plants, the vegetables. Uh, marigolds work really well with tomato plants, but there are many other plants that uh, have a, a synergy. Um, also, remember that <clears throat> we need to have our vegetables pollinated. And so that means to attract the bees. And some of the, uh, the plants that we grow are very attractive to the bees. One example is borage, which is a herb. Um, it's a very pretty herb. It's got a beautiful uh, blue flower to it. Uh, you can use it in salads, but its main advantage for the gardener is that it attracts the bees and also deter, deters some of the um, tomato hookworms, which can be a, a real problem, uh, or hornworms rather, which can be a real problem uh, to your tomato plants. When you're planting things like carrots, if you're putting in a row of carrots, put in a row of onions alongside the row of of carrots or chines or leeks um, because the uh, odor of the onions hides uh, the, the smell of the carrot to some extent and avoids getting carrot fly. Um, so you can use those uh, to help each other. The other thing is the tomatoes also grow very well with basil, garlic, broccoli, and marigolds, as, as I said. All of those are synergistic 
with tomatoes uh, in terms of dealing with uh, various bugs and, and other issues. Um, peas also grow well with garlic, uh, turnips, potatoes. That's another one of those groupings of um, companion plants. And there, if, if you look online, uh, there are lots of different lists that give you an insight into what these companion plants are. So we've talked about planting. So looking after the garden, before you, you start gardening, it, it's good to check the soil that you're looking at or using, both in terms of the nutrients that they've got in them, the acidity of the soil, and the drainage of the soil. Um, you don't want a garden that's going to be permanently waterlogged, although some plants like a lot of water, tomatoes are a good example of that, and potatoes, um, you don't want them to be permanently waterlogged, otherwise they will start rotting. You need the right acidity, which is about six to seven, um, to make sure that the plant can actually take up the nutrients that you feed it in the fertilizers. Basically, fertilizers, there's the uh, organic and inorganic fertilizers. Um, I'm not somebody who says you should only use organic uh, fertilizers because I think um, sometimes you, you need to get the right balance and some of the organic materials can't do that on their own. So sometimes you've got to add some organic um, or inorganic uh, materials as well. One of the things that's <clears throat> that really is important and, and to save yourself a considerable amount of work, it's using mulch and using mulch throughout the season to keep the weeds down. And not only does it keep the weeds down, but it also helps conserve the water around the plants and as a byproduct, puts both nutrients and some humus back into the soil. Uh, straw is, is a useful one to use, not necessarily hay, because there's a lot of grass seed in the hay. Um, but if you've got rotted down gr grass cuttings that have been rotted down for a year or so, that makes excellent mulch uh, and does help retain the soil. Throughout the year, you want to uh, monitor the condition of your soil to see whether you need to add additional nutrients. Um, heavy rain is a good indicator you might want to to monitor it, particularly if you've got a very sandy soil, um, that tends to leach the nutrients out very quickly with rain on sandy soil. So you may have to put more nutrients back in. Um, and remember to take the time, which is one of the things I have traditionally not been as good at, is to go out and thin out your crop so that each of the plants has the space to grow to their optimum size. Um, and this is particularly important with outdoor root crop like carrots, turnip, beetroot, onions. You need to make sure they've got sufficient space in the garden to be able to mature effectively. It always seems cruel to pull out plants I hate doing it, but you, you, you will get a better crop if you thin them out properly. And finally, the one thing that always gets missed is water, water, water. You've got to feed these with water. You know, I mean, recently we've had more than our fair share of water, but you know, come the summer months, um, they will dry out. So. If you want a good crop, you've got to feed it with water. 
That brings us to harvesting. For many of the crops, um, this goes on throughout the whole of the summer. Uh, and in many cases, actually harvesting the crop increases the crop because it stimulates the, the plants to produce more um, fruit for us. Um, also, the, the act of, of thinning out many of our crops also provides us with a regular harvest of small and young products. There's nothing quite as sweet as a small, thin, young carrot. They, they are great. So make your, your thinnings out a source of food. It works well. Often one of the earliest crops that we are harvest are going to be the overwintered garlics, which, uh, first of all, before you actually get the garlics, you actually get the garlic scapes, which I, I promise you are a great source for producing um, vinegar. Garlic scapes in vinegar is great, as is garlic pesto. So. Don't let those scapes escape. Make them into pesto, garlic pesto. Great. Keeps you going all through the winter. But then, of course, by the early summer, you're ready to be able to harvest your garlics as well. Most of our main crop comes around September. Oh, some of the crop, things like the root crops, the parsnips, actually improve their flavor if they're harvested just after the first frost of the fall. So they can stay in there through into October, uh, late October, some years. Um, and they're, they're really good. Actually, storing your harvest is a totally different presentation, and I don't really want to go getting into that right now. But storing your winter consume can for winter consumption can be done in many different ways. Um, my favorite way right now for root crops is actually packing them in to moist sand uh, and leaving them to uh, in a cool room uh, throughout the winter and just pull out carrots, parsnips, uh, whatever you want. Uh, throughout the whole of the winter, and it works really well. Um, let's see, next. Well, having quickly run through a season in the kitchen garden, how do we get ready for next year? And I think one of the things that's really important for this is to talk about seed savings. Because every year, you know, I always sort of look forward to seeing the uh, seed catalogs. But what I'm looking for there are new interesting varieties. I'm, I'm not looking at the cost of some of the seeds when, to be honest, you don't need to buy them because you save seeds from the crop you produce this year. And those, generally speaking, work well for future years. So the exception to that are some of the hybrid varieties. And those can be hybrid varieties of almost any one of the crops we're talking about, the vegetables we're talking about. Some of those do not breed true from the seeds. But most of the plants, particularly those that we talked about as heritage plants, those varieties that have been around for the last 40, 50 years or more, those you can just gather the seeds, let them dry out, and use them the following year. And some of the plants you can actually bring indoor for the winter, and particularly uh, herbs that you can pot on into smaller pots and bring indoors 
to provide you with a source of fresh herbs throughout the winter months. This is a picture of my kitchen garden last August, at the beginning of August. And that, just to give you an idea of how I've got my own garden laid out. It's slightly different this year in terms of where the crops are, because one thing that is important is crop rotation. So basically, most of the crops you see on the right hand side in this picture, this year are on the left hand side, and the ones on the left hand side are on the right hand side. In other words, I switch crops from one side of the garden to the other. Uh, just that's to deal with various kinds of bugs, um, balance out the nutrients a little bit between the soil uh, and, and use it that way. And that brings us towards the end of the presentation. I thank you very much for your attention. And I hope that you have a fruitful and enjoyable gardening season. Thank you. I'm open for questions.